Chime our hour for us. Okay, boys and girls, fellow, come on down. Boys, sit here on the floor, please. And young ladies, whoops, if I don't trip myself on the steps. Okay. I've got a few items here. I want to just set these on the floor where we can all see. Let me show you some. Show you something this morning. Here in just a minute, I guess you guys, can you guys see that? We'll put it here in just a minute where you can see that. Okay. Okay. Jesus, in, in Matthew, Jesus had a Sermon on the Mount. We call it the Sermon on the Mount, but he kind of went up into the mountains and he had followers there, the disciples followed him there. And he was doing some teaching. He did a lot of teaching while he was doing that. Teaching to the people, teaching to the disciples. And one thing he said was, one thing he taught was, Ye are the salt of the earth, but if the salt have lost its savor, wherein shall it be? Shall it be salted? It is henceforth good for nothing but to be cast out and to be trodden underfoot of men. So Jesus said, Ye are the salt of the earth. What do y'all think he meant by that? What did Jesus mean when he said we're the salt of the earth? What do you think he meant by that? What do you know about salt? Yeah, it dissolves when water hits it, doesn't it? But back in the old days, they didn't have refrigerators like we do now, and they didn't have coolers like we do now, and they didn't have a way to keep things like we do now. And one of the things that they used to preserve was they used salt. And uh, salt was very common. Uh, even in the Old Testament days, if you go back and look at the Old Testament, it, it talks a lot about salt and the use of salt and how they use salt. And the New Testament talks about salt. So even in Jesus' day, salt was, and even before Jesus' day, salt was very common. And uh, salt was used as a preservative and salt was used to flavor foods. Now, they didn't have a lot of things back in those days that, uh, that uh, they could use to flavor food with like we got now. We got a lot of different, different spices. You know, your mom uses spices to cook with and makes things taste so much better and if we didn't have salt. And, and, but even, of, uh, I, even about all these spices, what do you see on the table? You see salt, don't you? Salt and pepper. They're still around today, still common. So I think that what Jesus was saying when he was, said we needed to be the salt of the earth was that we needed to be, first of all, we needed to be like a preservative. You know, people, there's a lot of things that go bad in this world, a lot of bad things around us. And Jesus said we can be a preservative. We can fix that as his children. We can make that better. We can make the bad things better. And also, I think, you know, salt is one of the most common things there is. You know, like I said, it's just about on every dinner table you go to. You can't turn around without bumping into salt somewhere, it seems like. <coughs> Why does this book with water mountain? Yeah. And I think that's one thing Jesus was telling us. I think Jesus was telling us, you need to go out into the world and you need to be so common that people can't turn around without bumping into your influence. You know, we ought to be influencing the world. We ought to be an impacting the world. And what I kind of wanted to show you this morning is, uh, we're going to say this plate is the world. This plate's the world. And I'm going to put a little salt on this plate. We are. That's, that's salt. That's salt. And we're the salt of the world. So that's salt. We're the salt of the world. So that's salt's on this world. Yeah. Okay, and in here, I've got some pepper. Okay, now we're, we are to be the salt of the world, so we go out in the world, we try to be good, don't we? But what do you think Satan thinks about our being salt of the world? What do you think the devil thinks about it? Christ told us to be the salt of the world. What do you think? The devil don't like that, does it? Does it? Eh, he doesn't like that a bit. 
He's going to try to prevent us from being the salt of the world. And he's going to throw temptation out there. And he's going to go. He's going to throw sin out there. And he's going to go throw everything in our way. Yeah, yeah, chocolate. I'm going to eat them. Yeah. And I've got some pepper here. I'm going to sprinkle some pepper. See, we're the salt of the world. But Satan throws things in there like that and that pepper. And it kind of covers up that salt. Sometimes we don't be, we're not the influence we need to be. Because, uh, because we let sin get in our lives, don't we? We let that old, old black stuff, that old black sin. And we let those things get, kind of get in the way. So now you've got the salt and the pepper mixed, don't you? You got the you got the good thing that we're supposed to be, and you got sometimes sin gets in the way, and temptation gets in the way, preventing us uh, from doing what we need to do. Can that salt get rid of that pepper? No, it can't get rid of that pepper. What do you think it takes to get rid of the pepper? It takes God, doesn't it? it? Takes Jesus to get rid of that pepper, and that's what we have to do. With salt of earth, we still have to pray to God, and we have to depend on God. And this is kind of like what happens. See that that pepper is out there, and it's on that salt, and it's impacting the salt. But if I take this little spoon, I rub it on my shoulder, rub it on my shirt. Okay, now watch what happens when this goes across that. Goes across that. See what it does? Whoa. It picks up that pepper, doesn't it? And it'll pick up all that pepper. It'll pick up all that pepper. I rub it on the carpet. It'll really do it. See, it picks up that pepper. And if you look on that box, on that thing, you see you see that pepper. Mm hmm So what that tells us is, what that shows us is that as salt, we can't necessarily get rid of all that pepper that's in the world. But God can do it. God can take it away. God can make us salt again. God can make us what He wants us again. And so we have to stay close to Him. And we have to pray and we have to stay close to him. And we have to remember that we are his salt in the world. And it's his salt. We've got to keep the pepper out. We're the salt. We've got to keep the pepper out. We've got to keep the bad stuff out. And we do that by staying close to him and coming to Sunday school and staying in his word and, and praying to him. Okay? Let's go to the Lord in the word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, you have put us as salt on this earth. The Lord, from the youngest to the oldest, as your children, you put us as salt on the earth. Lord, we do let things get in the way of being that salt. And Lord, we pray you would remove those things. Lord, help us keep us as salt. Help us to keep us as an influence and an impact on the world. Lord, forgive us where we fail you in doing that. Lord, bless these children. We are so thankful for them, Lord. I just pray that you'll just let them know how loved they are by this church body, Lord, and how important we see them. And Lord, we're just thankful for them in our midst. Lord, forgive us of our sins. We ask these things in Christ's name. Amen. Okay, guys. Good morning. I think Dennis needs to go around and show some of the adults that. Because they were looking over, too. They wanted to peek and see the, the pepper on the spoon. That was a great message. So, good morning. Uh, we're going to have our call to worship now. It's a little different. I'm going to be leading some of the worship um, from now on, as much as Miss Judy allows to let me. And go ahead and find number hymn 72, Holy Ground, where two or more are gathered in his name. He is here, and he makes us holy, and evil is not here. <laughs> oh, yeah, sorry.
Okay, let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we pray today that you would watch over us and, and be so close to us today, Lord, as we worship you. And Father, when we walk out of here today, we will know without any question but that you are here. We pray, Lord, that our hearts will be pure, our eyes will be focused on you, our ears will be tuned to listen to what you have to say to us. We ask, Lord, through all of this, Lord, that Jesus will be honored and glorified. We pray for those, Lord, who are still sick, who are still fighting flu and viruses and all kinds of things, Lord, and we ask that you would watch over them and strengthen them and bring them back to us. But we pray, Father, that you will keep the rest of us safe. We pray, Father, for those who are going through many other difficulties. And we ask, Lord, that you would help them to remember that you are a God who loves them and you are a God who holds them close. And we pray, Father, that because of what they're going through, that they might be drawn closer to you. We ask, Lord, for your blessings on our country. We pray, Lord, for our, our president. We pray for our congressmen and, and women. And we ask, Lord, that you would guide them. And, Father, that you would intervene in our country and bring us back to you. We thank you, Lord, for hearing our prayer today, for watching over us and being so near and dear to us. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Let's continue singing. Please find your hymnal, hymn number 66. And we're going to sing that through one time. But first, we're going to do the responsive reading. Uh, worshipers, that's y'all. Please read the worshipers in the bold print. And then go ahead and find hymn number 68 and turn on over to Holy, Holy, Holy after we finish singing Open the Eyes of My Heart. Then the eyes of the blind will be opened and the ears de of the deaf unstopped. Then the lame will leap like a deer, and the tongue of the mute will sing for joy. For water will gush in the wilderness, and streams in the desert. The parched ground will become a pool of water, and the thirsty land springs of water. A will be there and away. It will be called the holy land, the unclean will not travel on it, for they will be for him who walks the path, even the blue. There will be no lion there, and no vicious beast will go up on it. They will not be found there, but the redeemed will walk on it. I will reflect on all you have done, and that will take on your actions. God, your way is so. Jesus said, I came into this world for judgment, in order that those who do not see will see and those who do see will become blind. Open our eyes that we may see wonderful things in your law. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. of my heart. 
team. Shall we gather at the river? 604, first and last verses. <laughs> Good singing. This time, please stand for the doxology number 668. Remain standing for the offertory prayer to fall. Let us pray. <coughs> Heavenly Father, you are mighty. You are holy. And we pray to you through your Son, Jesus Christ, who is the first and the last. We ask that you bless the word today, dear Lord, and lay on the message to, to our pastor and that he will put out the word that we may use it and, and have all it for us, for your glory. We ask that you bless this offering dear Lord that that you will use it where you will need it for all that we do is for you give us all the the strength that we may need dear Lord to go on and to do your will and all we do and say we pray in Jesus name Amen, Amen. Amen.
you ever wonder what heaven is going to be like? What it looks like? Well, you know, the Bible tells us what it's like. And I've got a friend that, uh, the name is Cecil Gooden, who wrote a bunch of songs for me. And one of the songs he wrote was a song called, I Can See Heaven. And, of course, he's there now, and I know he's, he's experiencing what we're talking about, what we're singing about. So I want to just share this song with you this morning. I can see heaven I see the angels Around the great throne I see my loved ones Who've already gone I can see Jesus Standing alone see heaven, the streets of pure gold, the walls of jasper, the gates made of pearl. I can see mansions built by the hands that made our world. I see is the man on the tree reaching down his hand for me. Well. Through the eyes of Jesus, I can see heaven. I see the saints waited so long and heaven's chorus singing their song I can see Jesus like I've never known oh I can see heaven the streets of pure gold of jasper and the gates made of pearl I can see mansions built by the hands that made our world and the heaven I see is the man on the tree reaching down his hand for me and the heaven I see is the man on the tree reaching down his hand for me. Well, if I can't preach after that, I guess I'll just give up. Thank you, Jack. Well, turn with me please to Revelation chapter 21. I want to tell you, I'm so excited about this message. I just really am. And uh, the more I study, the more excited I got. And um, I, I just realized that there was just so much more material than, uh, than I could share in one message. So I didn't want to keep you too long today. I uh, want to give you a little bit at a time. Today we're going to be talking about the surprises of heaven. The surprises of heaven. We're going to start with verse 1 of Revelation 21. We're going to read the first seven verses. Would you stand with me as we honor God's word? <clears throat> then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Now the dwelling of God is with men, and he will live with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the order, old order of things has passed away. He who was seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. 
Then he said, write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. He said to me, it is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To him who is thirsty, I will give to drink without cost from the spring of the water of life. He who overcomes will inherit all this. And I will be his God, and he will be my son. Thank you. You may be seated. <coughs> Lynn Dean once imagined what it would be like when he got to heaven. He said, I dreamt death came the other night and heaven's gate swung wide. An angel with a halo bright ushered me inside. There to my astonishment stood folks I had judged and labeled as quite unfit or of little worth or spiritually disabled. Indignant words rose to my lips that never were set free. For every face showed stunned surprise. Not one expected me. <laughs> surprise. You know, I truly believe that those of us who get to heaven are going to be surprised in many different ways. Now this message about heaven has been building and growing in, in, my, in my heart for years. Years. Uh, but I need to tell you up front that this is not intended to, to be a message that lays out all the answers. I don't have all the answers, for one thing. Uh, in fact, I don't think any human being does. Uh, we're not going to get into speculation or visions or uh, measurements or location or anything like that. Because that's not the purpose of this message. The only things we know about heaven are the things that God has told us. And you may be surprised to learn that many of the things we believe about heaven are not in the Bible. We do know some things though. Revelation 21.5 describes heaven as the holy city, the new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God. Prepared as a bride beautifully dressed for her husband. In other places in scripture we learn that heaven is God's dwelling place. Jesus called, uh, called heaven it, uh, his father's house. Um, Hebrews 11.10 tells us that it is a city designed and built by God. And the 12th chapter of Hebrews says that heaven is where followers of Christ go when they die. Uh, Philippians chapter 1 says that... Um, excuse me. Hebrews chapter 11... He Hebrews chapter 12 says that it is a better country and Philippians 1 tells us that it is the place where followers of Christ go when they die. And where else would we go? You know? Um, we see in the first chapter of Acts that heaven is where Jesus is right now. Uh, Romans chapter 8 tells us that Jesus is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. Now listen, if, if you want to do some, uh, some additional reading on your own about this subject, I, I want to recommend two books. And there's plenty of good ones out there, but these are just two that I have experience with. One is just simply called Heaven. It was written just a few years ago by Randy Alcorn, maybe 10, 10 years ago. Randy Alcorn is called Heaven. It's a great little book. Um, and the other one... Uh, is, a, is a little tiny little book entitled Heaven, How to Get There. Uh, it was written years and years ago by D.L. Moody. Now I do want to caution you about reading just any book that has the word heaven in the title. Um, there are some people who claim, and I was just really surprised when I was doing a little bit of research, how many people claim to have spent days and days and days already in heaven. That God's given them this vision about what heaven's like. And when you begin to read some of it, you realize that some of what they're claiming it cannot be backed up by Scripture. So be real careful uh, about reading books about heaven or any other subject that are contrary to what Scripture teaches. Avoid those. Now, if we were to take a poll here today and ask the question, who in here is willing right now to totally surrender all right and claim uh, to their lives and make Jesus Lord of their lives? Or we might have some hands, we'd have some hands go up, but I don't think it would be unanimous. But if we were to ask, who wants to go to heaven, probably every hand would go up. But here's the problem. Those two questions are one and the same. They're the same question. And many people have convinced themselves that they are going to heaven without making proper arrangements to get there. 
They think they're just going to waltz right in. and uh, God's even going to invite them to sit on the throne with him. Because they're such good people. And everybody loves them. Um, talk, about, talk about a surprise. One class of third graders in Union City, Tennessee was asked this question a few years ago. What is heaven like? <laughs> One little girl replied, and this is third grade now. She said, heaven is where I will meet the man of my dreams. <laughs> A little boy in that same class said, heaven is where some very nice teachers and a real nice principal will be found. Kind of sounds like a young man who stayed in trouble most of the time. Well, I asked my friends on Facebook to help me with this sermon. I was almost overwhelmed with their answers. More than 80 of them, actually. And I asked them, what is the first thing that comes into your mind when you see the word heaven? I was just swamped with answers. Uh, here's, here's just some of them. Here's some of the people that you know. Gary Boland, who preached our revival last year. Uh, said home with an exclamation, par, uh, exclamation mark. Krista Denley uh, said uh, reunion. Debbie Good agreed with that saying she was looking forward to seeing loved ones again. Uh, Billy Joe Crawford and, and Belinda Solly said that the word perfect came to mind. Christian Hales said perfect light. Uh, Jack Hollingsworth wrote Jesus. Mary Gray said no more worries. Jennifer Ford commented excitement and security. Cheryl Ross mentioned the streets of gold and Angela Boyd uh, added warmth, peacefulness, hope. Sherry Henriquez said the throne of God. Leanne Morgan wrote beauty. Jackie Berger and Buddy Wally and Sylvia Opiella all mentioned peace. Lindell Wally uh, said Jesus on his throne. They moved to Texas but they never have left. <laughs> Jesus on his throne, arms open and room for me. Don't you like that one? Um, Carol Newman combined those ideas by saying peace and rest in the arms of Jesus. Uh, Joanne Cranfield said, I would finally be able to rejoice with my heavenly father. Teresa McBride commented, no more tears. And Holly Mulder wrote, home, wonder and awe. I, have all, I always have this picture of colors being more intense and richer in heaven. A garden of surpassing beauty. That's just the people you know. One person wrote, I'm going there one day and it won't be a 90 minute, 90 minute experience either. It will be for all eternity. One of my high school classmates uh, who suffered with many physical problems over the last few years uh, said, no pain. <laughs> Someone else said that the word heaven reminds them of being with God. Another commented, a feeling of complete safety and no knowledge of evil. Three people mentioned love. One of them called it great. Another one called it uh, unbelievable. I, and I like this answer, uh, no more separation. A heavenly dimension so much greater than anything I can even imagine. Eternal peace and joy. She said, I get excited just writing about it. Maybe I should do this every day. <laughs> Other responses were eternity. Everlasting life in the presence of Christ. An intensely blue sky that goes on forever. One person said, Jesus and falling at his feet, thanking and praising him. And another said, finally seeing the face of Jesus. You know, it's interesting that all those different answers should be given. Heaven is all of those things and much more. Since human language can only begin to describe the glories of heaven and, and we're so limited in our experiences here on the earth, it is safe to say that heaven is going to be a great big surprise for those of us who get there. What, what in heaven will amaze us? Today I want to show you three things. First of all, we're going to be surprised to discover that many of the things we've believed about heaven are not true. You see, there are many myths and misconceptions about, about heaven. I want to try to straighten out a few of them. First, uh, the Bible does not teach that there is a temporary place we go when we die. Some call that purgatory. 
Uh, but there is nothing in Scripture about such a place. That is a purely human invention. Second, uh, many people uh, picture someone who has died as having gained their wings. Sitting on a cloud wearing a halo and strumming a harp. Uh, if we're honest, we have to admit to, to each other that that sounds really, really boring. Right? I mean, who wants to do that? Well, thankfully, the, the Bible never tells us any of that. We do not get our wings. We do not turn into angels. We don't wear a halo when we die. A God who sent... Now, just think about this. This is just common sense. A God who sent Jesus to die on the cross and, and, uh, and to, to, to give us an abundant life would never confine us to an eternity of boredom. If he claimed that we would have eternal, uh, uh, an abundant life here, can you imagine what it's going to be like over there? And then third, but most importantly, and I want to spend most of the time on, on that, many people believe that when someone dies, they automatically go to heaven. Now, I want you to think with me about something here. I want you to follow me very closely. Many of the world's religions have an idea of some type of afterlife. Uh, some place we go when we die. But for those of us who tend to lean toward the Christian faith, the only reason we even know that there is a heaven is because God has told us about it. Right? Doesn't it logically follow that we should listen to Him about what heaven is really like? Doesn't it make sense that we should find out what he says about it? And to what he says about how to get there? Now sure that makes a lot of sense. That we should turn to him and turn to his word. To find out as much as we can about heaven. And, and not, not listen to or be influenced by those who have no understanding of what scripture says. It just amazes me. If you want to know what heaven is like and, and how to get there. Don't listen to atheists. Don't listen to cynical philosophers. Don't listen to celebrities, regardless of how popular they are. Listen to what God says. Jesus himself said, I tell you the truth. No one can see the kingdom of God unless he is born again. John 3.3 3. The Bible makes it very, very clear that those who go to heaven are those who have confessed and repented of their sins and have followed Jesus in true discipleship. No one else. It's not going to church. It's not being an American. It's not even being well liked and loved by family and friends. None of that qualifies anyone to get through the gates. In fact, there are many, many people who think they're going to heaven who will never actually even see the gates. In Matthew 7, 21, Jesus taught, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many people honestly believe that all you have to do to get to heaven is die. You can live however you want to. You can have nothing to do with God or His church. But when you die, you're going to just slide right in. But that's not what the Bible teaches. Not everyone will be there. So, one of the truths we need to take away here today is that just because we read about it in a book, or hear a celebrity say it, or even see it on Christian television, does not make it true. Many of the things we have believed about heaven are not true. Not even, not even the ones that make us feel all tingly all over. Or even sound the most sensational. There are many things about heaven that we do not know. But the only things we can know for certain are what we read about in scripture. So the first surprise is to discover that many of the things we have believed about God are not true. Now the second thing that's going to surprise us uh, is that we're going to discover that it is so much more beautiful and glorious than we have ever imagined. So much more beautiful and glorious than we've ever imagined. The Bible says that heaven is the place where God dwells. 
that it will be a place of great joy in his presence. We read that people of all races and all tongues will be there. I want you to take a, a quick tour with me uh, in the, these last two chapters of the Bible, especially chapter 21 that we read the first seven verses from. Look, look at those things, look at those verses again, and we're going to look down even a little bit further. Uh, even John, seeing it in his revelation, had trouble coming up with the right words to describe it. And the best he could do to describe heaven was to say uh, that it was like uh, an entire city of pure, transparent gold. You ever seen transparent gold? That, we, we can't even imagine what that's like. Well, well, look, at, look at verse 18. Revelation 21, 18. Because you'll see there that he says that the wall was made of jasper. The city of pure gold as pure as glass. The whole city's that way. He said in verse, uh, verse 19. The foundations of the city walls were decorated with every kind of precious stone. The city has, verse 21, the city has 12 gates. 12 gates, which, are, which were 12 pearls, each gate made of a single pearl. The great street of the city was of pure gold like transparent glass. Now look at 21, 23. He says, the city does not need the sun or the moon to shine on it, for the glory of God gives it light, and the Lamb is its light. And if you weren't gripped by this truth earlier, I want you to pay attention to 2127. Nothing impure will ever enter it. Nor will anyone who does what is shameful or deceitful, but only those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life. You say, that's really narrow-minded. Well, sure it is, but God made that up, not me. It's what God said. One day several years ago I was admiring a, a, a stunning scene in heaven. I guess this is where the whole germ for this, these messages came from. I was looking at something I really enjoy, uh, appreciate beautiful things in nature. And I was looking at, at something, just admiring it so much. And I, I was suddenly struck by the thought that as beautiful as this world is, uh, that heaven will be even more so. You know, here on the earth we have the wonders of our forests and our seas. We have the beauties of our mountains and our desert. Uh, but the most beautiful things here on earth will be as nothing when compared to the glories of heaven and the beauties that we'll see there. One of the things I enjoy most is to sit at the base of a waterfall. Just watch it. Be up close and watch it. Feel the spray on my face. And you know it even creates kind of a wind too. When there's a waterfall. There's a wind that blows. But the glories of heaven will far surpass the most beautiful waterfall here on the earth. I truly appreciate the deep fragrance of a rose. But the fragrances of heaven will be so much sweeter. One of my favorite things to do is to walk on the beach and the edge of the water just right, just before or right at sunrise or sunset, either one. But the pleasures of heaven will be so much richer. There's nothing on earth like hearing a grandchild say, I love you, Papa. Nothing like it. But that doesn't even compare to the day when I will hear the voice of my Savior for the first time say, Welcome home. Think about the, the sights that delight your eyes the most. The things that bring you joy. It goes all the way down to your heart. And then understand that the joys of heaven will be deeper and sweeter still. I believe that the beauties of this world are only a hint. Only a hint of the glories that await us on the other side. The colors of our world, the, the music, the pleasures, the food, the friendships, all of them, they're only hints of the magnificence and grandeur of our eternal home. There was once a little girl who was born blind. But her mother tried her best to, to, to make sure that her daughter experienced life at its fullest. 
So one thing the mom did was to plant a, a flower garden and every year uh, she would take her little girl out there and they would sit for hours and she would try to describe the flowers and the, the beautiful colors to her little girl and she'd pick flowers and let her smell them and feel them. She just, she just loved to do that. She, the, the little girl loved the smell and she, be, she taught her little girl how to distinguish uh, from one flower to the other just by the way that it smelled and the way that it felt. She said she could imagine how beautiful they are. Well, when she turned 14, their family doctor called and told them about an experimental surgery that might help her to see. Well, she had the surgery, but she had to wait six weeks before they could take the bandages off. The big day finally arrived and the little girl asked if they could not remove the bandages outside in her mother's garden. Because she said that she wanted that to be the very first thing she would see. But when they pulled off the bandages, the, the little girl opened her eyes and she twisted her head left and then right. She started crying. And she said to her mom, you never said it was this beautiful. You never said it was this beautiful. You know, the finest of human speech could never describe for us how beautiful the splendors of heaven will be. You may remember studying in school about a man in the early days of our country, a preacher who later became a president at Princeton University. His name was Jonathan Edwards. Jonathan Edwards, uh, and the reason you may have read about him in school was because of his famous sermon called Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. You know, you think as much as we studied about that in school, you think that was the only sermon that poor man ever preached. Um, but he had more than one sermon. And in another sermon, uh, he was talking about the glories of heaven. He said, if we search, now, now remember he wrote this a long, this was a long time ago, so his, uh, his, the wording of the language is a little bit different, but you'll, you'll get it. If we search all the face of the earth, and not only so, but tear out its bowels and, and ransack its inwards, or dive to the bottom of the sea, go and look into the palaces and stately rooms of princes and search their coffers, Yea, if we take in the visible heavens and everything that we can discover there and put all these things together and imagine much better and more beautiful than they are, we can get nothing that will serve to give us a picture of heavenly glory. Now all of that together is just not enough to show us what heaven's like. And then, I, then he asked, and I'm going to paraphrase this, is it possible for us to really believe that heaven is all that we read about in Scripture? That heaven is really that, and yet still have our hearts tangled up in the things of this life? Said He said that just doesn't make sense to him. We're going to be amazed and surprised to discover that heaven is much more beautiful than we have ever imagined. And then number three, we will be surprised to discover how worthless are the things we loved here on the earth. How worthless they are. In Matthew 6, 19 through 21, Jesus uh, helped us to understand that there's a big difference between the treasures we have here on the earth and the treasures we shall have in heaven. He said, Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth, he told us. Where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven. Where moth and rust do not destroy. Where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. You know, the things that we, the things that we loved and treasured here on earth will all be forgotten once we get to heaven. I'm pretty nostalgic, you know, almost, almost to a fault. Um, I, I tend to hang on to things that remind me of another time or someone dear to me. I have a set, I've mentioned this to you before, I have a set of antique poker chips. Not because I play poker, I never have, but because they belong, once belonged to my grandfather. That's the only reason I keep them. 
Nearly every day I sit at a desk. In fact, the desk at home that I wrote this message, where I wrote this message, I sit at that desk nearly every day. It once belonged to that same grandfather. It was a desk that was special to my own dad, which I lovingly restored with my own hands. Those things are precious to me. But one day in heaven, they won't even matter. If I can't take it with me when I stand before God, it's going to be worthless in heaven. There's an old legend. It tells of a beautiful swan that came down out of the sky and landed on the banks of a pond near where a crane was wading about looking for snails. Well, the crane stopped looking for snails and for a few moments he looked at the, at the swan and finally in day's wonder he said where do you come from? And the swan said I came from heaven. Heaven? What is heaven? Where is heaven? Asked the crane. Heaven? Said the swan. Heaven? You've never heard of heaven? And the beautiful bird went on to describe the grandeur of the eternal city. She she told about streets of gold and the gates and the walls made of precious stones. The river of life, uh, purest crystal upon whose banks is the tree whose leaves shall be for the healing of the nations. In eloquent terms, the swan sought to describe the, the hosts who live in the other world. But the crane seemed not to be interested in the least. Finally the crane said, are there snails there? Snails, repeated the swan. No, of course there aren't any snails. And then said the crane as it continued its search along the banks of the pond. You can have your heaven. I want snails. What do the snails in your life look like? What, what, what kinds of things are you treasuring in your life? They may not be something you can hold in your hands. Instead, they might be some activity that you enjoy. Some relationship that's special to you. Even some dream that you've harbored for years. Are those things preventing you from taking hold of heaven? Are you frantically looking for snails when God offers you heaven? F.J. Berry uh, wrote the words to a gospel song that was popular years and years and years ago. Uh, it asked a similar question. Uh, part of the song went like this. Brother afar from the Savior today, risking your soul for the things that decay. Oh, if today God should call you away, what would you give in exchange for your soul? If when you stand at the bar by and by, when you are weighed in the balance on high, you should be sentenced forever to die, what would you give in exchange for your soul? And the chorus went like this. What would you give? What would you give? What would you give in exchange for your soul? Oh, if today God should call you away, what would you give in exchange for your soul? What little insignificant things are you clinging to? What habits or attitudes in your life do you insist on embracing which are keeping you from the Savior? Are you exchanging heaven for them? D.L. Moody in that little book I mentioned earlier, Heaven, How to Get There. He asked the question, You who have Christ, would you like to part with Him for gold? Would you like to give him up for all the honor the earth can bestow on you for a few months or a few years? You see, everyone is going to spend eternity somewhere. Let that sink in. Everyone is going to spend eternity somewhere. The Bible teaches us that there are only two possible destinations. And we get to choose where we're going to spend eternity. We, we get to choose. But there's a catch. 
You want to hear what the catch is? You better want to hear it. I'm going to tell you anyway. We must choose on this side of death as to where we're going to go when we die. We have to choose here. We don't die and then God says, now where would you like to go? We choose now. We choose now. And since none of us knows when that time will come for any of us, it makes sense. It makes sense that we should not only choose on this side of death, but that we must choose now. So, I ask you today to give serious thought as to where you will spend eternity. You're going to spend it somewhere. Yes, there will be surprises for those of us get to get to heaven. And there's more yet to come. But the most awful surprise will be for those who think they're going to heaven, but are not. Will that be you? Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we come to you today thanking you that you've made it possible for people like us to go to heaven in the first place. You've, you've provided a place for us to go. You, you don't just throw us down here for a few years and then say, well, that's it. You have provided an eternal home in the heavens not built with human hands. And you've made it possible through the death of your son Jesus, the blood that he shed on the cross, for us to be able to enter. Those people who don't deserve to, to be there to start with. But Lord, we thank you that through your grace you've made it possible for us to be there. And we thank you, Lord, that there's no, there's no word, there's no language here on this side of eternity that can completely describe what it's going to be like. And so therefore, we're going to be surprised so much more than we've ever dreamed of. But Lord, I pray that if somebody here today doesn't know you, that you'll drive home that truth that everybody's going to spend eternity somewhere. They must choose now. Now. I pray, Lord, that none of us in this room or whoever hears this message from now on will ever, will ever wake up on the other side of death and be totally surprised because they didn't go. They didn't make it. I pray, Father, you'll teach us, Father, how important it is to put our faith and trust in you and what Jesus did for us on the cross. And I pray, Lord, if there's somebody in this room right now and they do not know Jesus as their Lord and Savior, that they will surrender to him today. They'll not waste another second with excuses or procrastination or anything else. They will surrender to you now. Behold, today is the day of salvation. I pray, the Lord, that you'll give us the courage to say, I don't know Jesus, but I want to. That place you describe called heaven sounds wonderful, and I want to make sure I go there. And I also pray, Father, that you'll put such a burden on our hearts for our family and our, our friends who don't know you. That, Father, we will do everything in our power to... To make sure they go with us. Oh, who will come and go with me? I'm bound for the promised land. Let us sing that, Lord, in our hearts and live it with our testimonies. So now with your head still bowed, I'm asking, you know what I'm asking. I'm asking that if Jesus is speaking to your heart, the Holy Spirit is 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 impressing on your, your soul, your need for Jesus, that today will be the day you stop putting it off. Don't run away from Him. Run to Him. And you make it clear during this invitation time that that's what you want for your life. You want this abundant life. You want it now and you want it forever. You come. You come as we, as, as we stand and as our, our organist plays, Lord. 
will you speak to these people? Lord, will you convict them and convince them of their need for you? Thank you, Father. Now, would you come as we stand? Billy Graham film. Hope you'll be here and bring somebody with you. Time for our blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. Amen. See you tonight. Love you. Much.